couple of years ago, I did a video on like shutter images and how different shutter images represented one thing differently. And for the last couple of years, I've been thinking about doing a follow-up video for the people that have cameras that don't have an option to change the shutter angle. So if you want to change your shutter speed to emulate a particular shutter angle, how do you know what the shutter speed is? Well, through the magic of Google, I have learned the answer, and I'm here to share it with you. Or you could just go Google the answer for yourself. If you're watching this video, start figure out what you're going to answer. <laughs> All you have to do is take your frame rate, multiply it by 360, and then divide by the shutter angle. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you in another one. So really, that's just if you want to stop watching this video, now, you know the answer, and you can go and change the speed accordingly. But if you want to stick around and listen to me talk more about shutter angles and shutter speed, then feel free to keep us in mind. So it's important to know that the shutter speed and shutter angles are just different ways of doing this, but talking about the same thing. So it doesn't really matter whether you have a camera that can see shutter angle or shutter speed. They're, do they're doing the same thing. The helpful thing about the camera that can switch to shutter angle is that you can pretty much just set it and forget it. It doesn't really matter what frame rate you're shooting in. If you set your camera to 180 degrees and you change the frame rate, the camera's going to automatically adjust the shutter speed. So it quick back to 180 degrees. Now, I talked about where the 180 degree thing came from, but it's also important to know that it's not really a rule. It's just kind of a standard. And it really only pertains to 24 frames per second. And if you shoot higher frames per second with the intent of slowing them down for a 24 frames per second project, then you can still use the 180 degree shutter angle. But it's also important to realize that that's not going to give you the same amount of motion when you slow it. But it's fine. You're really going to get much less motion blur, which, if you think about it, is okay. Because if you watch something go really slow, it's not as blurry as if you watch it go really fast. If you want to see in a high frame rate and use that frame rate as a project setting, then the 180 degree rate doesn't make sense anymore. And Gerald and Dunn did a much really helpful video. Kind of just support thing, just a lot of standard footage, and people watch different standards and they're like, yeah, that looks right, or that looks fun. Um, so go watch that. And there's also a really good blog post that I, that I came across from reading from research in this video, and I'll put that in the description. If you want to shoot in 60 frames per second, then don't shoot one of the 120, shoot one of the 60, which is the 360 degree step. That'll give you much more motion blur and think much more closely to. The one of the 48, the one of the 50, and the degree set of angle that we're used to seeing in 24 frames per second. And going back to that whole war thing, you don't have to see the 180 for every scene. And the example that I talked about in my previous video of saving Pat Ryan is one that, you know, so a lot of people have seen it's easy to bring to mind, and it's also easy to understand. For a lot of the, you know, action scenes, the storming of the peace in Normandy, they thought a lot about in either 90 degrees or 45 degrees, which to give you a quick reference, 24 frames per second, 90 degrees is 1 over 96 sub feet, and 45 degrees is 1 over 192. So what does that do in terms of how the image was part of the scene? The people running crazily in the back of the and places running for the they look a lot more like jerky, like stick off, and it gives a sort of hectic feeling, stressful feeling. And one of the primary reasons for that was to capture the explosions in much greater detail. Without all the motion blur, all of the shrapnel and the particles are in jets and sort of flying through the air. You can see them much more clearly than you, can, than you would be able to see with the traditional cinematic motion blur. Going in the opposite direction, um, one example that I came across was the film Public Enemies by the director Michael Mann. And I think he even used this in a couple of different films as well. So he shot at 360 degrees, and that has the effect of giving much more motion blur than what he's seen. I guess the bottom line there is um, there's a lot of different reasons that you might want to change the angle and the speed and go away from 180 degrees or 150 or 148, but always have a reason in mind. And don't do it for exposure. You have to be more thoughtful behind exposure than you get. So I think even that's going to be a lot of work for we need to use any sort of base to set the to expect it. Just please, don't, don't do that. Go get a variable ND filter. You don't have to buy an expensive one. So this is getting way too complicated, way too much detail. Um, hopefully you picked up this video 10 minutes ago when I gave you the equation. <laughs>
I'm also going to put in the description of this video an answer for all the different um, cell angles and different uh, frameworks. So you don't have to do the equation, but you can just cut and paste this or write it in the that's it. I hope you enjoyed that, or I hope you got something out of it. As always, if there's questions, comments, concerns, suggestions, leave them in the comments. Like this video if you liked it. Dislike if you found it stuck. Feel free to subscribe if you are feeling generous. And maybe watch one of these other videos that are floating on the screen right now. They're probably not very good, but you know, watch them for a few seconds and then go watch.